I'm Kevin Elmy, and in this presentation, we're going to talk about weeds and why they grow. We spend most of our time managing weeds. They seem to pop up uh, everywhere. They're growing everywhere. They just irritate us. Uh, we are told they steal uh, soil moisture from our crop. They steal nutrients. They're bad, bad things. When we do have a flush of weeds out in the fields and the neighbors see them, we may be regarded as a bad farmer. It's We have this pride of having a clean monoculture field. That is the measure in agriculture today. When we are looking at weed control strategies, so in the organic system, tillage is about the only consistent way that weeds can be controlled. But there's multiple flushes, there's annual weeds, there's biennial weeds, there's perennial weeds. The question I always ask, and whether it's tillage or in the conventional world uh, using herbicides, if tillage or herbicides were so successful, why do we still have weeds? And the, the, the answer usually comes back, well, you know, it, these came over from the neighbors, it was in the seed I purchased, it was from the deer, from the geese, uh, in the water, it, it's not my fault, they, they came from somewhere else. When we look at nature, nature has a plan of succession. When we're looking at bare rock, we're dealing with very bacterial uh, uh, type of, of situation. The lichens then move in, then we get into the small plants and lichens, we get into the grasses and the perennials, then we get into shrubs and forests. Plant succession, uh, soil succession, they go hand in hand. So when we're looking at this plant and soil ecology, without any interference in nature, the transition will be going to forests. When the Canadian prairies, prior to European settlers, they were vast grasslands. The fires kept that succession from continuing on from the grassland to the forest. So every time that a shrub or a tree started growing, a fire would come in and it would revert back to being a grassland. European settlers came, started developing roads, those roads stopped the fires and then the succession, the plant succession, was able to continue which then now we have bush and forest where in the past was uh, vast grasslands. In agriculture we manage this plant and soil ecology and succession with disturbance and in a lot of cases this disturbance is tillage, it's fire, uh, grazing, adding manure or adding synthetics. Each disturbance alters the fungal bacteria ratio in the soil. That fungal bacteria ratio in the soil will determine and influence what plants are able to grow and which ones will be able to thrive. When we have young soils, they are bacterially dominated. That means we have lots of nitrates. We have uh, early successional plants. When we have more fungal dominated, we have more ammonium in the soil. We have more woody plants, more trees. So each one of these disturbances that we do, the more dramatic or traumatic that, that, that disturbance is, the more that fungal bacteria ratio falls. Early successional plants like low fungal to bacteria ratios because that means that soil is bacterial dominated and it has high nitrates. So early successional plants like low fungal bacteria ratios, those early successional plants are what we regard as weeds. So each plant has an ideal fungal to bacteria ratio in which they prefer to grow in. That is their signal to grow. As the fungal to bacteria ratio changes, different plants start to grow. 
if you've listened to any of my presentations before, you'll see this this slide that I like using because it's a nice visual so we can take a look at, at what's happening in the soil. When we deal with bare parent material, so rock, which it's all bacteria. Bacteria is going to be growing on it. It's going to be uh, breaking down that rock, starting the creation of soil. As we get more fungal, now we get more diversity starting to grow in that young soil. When we start getting the fungal bacterial ratio, so that's that F to B, uh, once we get to point one, this is where weeds grow, this is where we deal with high nitrates in the soil, and normally we deal with a lack of oxygen from compacted soil. This is once again maybe where something like thistles come in. As we progress and we go to, to a, a point three fungal to bacterial ratio, we get our early season grasses, that progresses, we get to a, a 0.75, our mid grasses, our clovers, and our vegetables like growing there. We get a fungal bacteria ratio of one to one. That's where late successional grasses are, row crops and our native plants start kicking in. Once we get over that one to one, now we start seeing some shrubs, some vines, some bushes, well, if we were growing cotton here maybe, uh, and, and more native species. Once we get you know, into that five to one fungal bacteria, this is where we start seeing the aspen trees. Uh, once we get beyond that, this is when the pines start kicking in. This is that successional path that our, our soils and our plants are taking. As we are increasing or decreasing based on what disturbance we are applying to that soil, will determine which plants are gonna be best suited for that situation. So as an example, if a field uh, that was uh, previous cropland was seeded down to hay, that would, as a quick guess, uh, an assumption that the fungal bacteria ratio is around 0.15. So in the soil for every, every pound of bacteria, there is 0.15 pounds of fungi in the soil. Most people, when they're seeding down a forage crop, will use a nurse cover crop. That produces production in year one. That nurse crop is then cut and baled, normally because they want to compete with the weeds. So that this one, number one, there's uh, some productivity in year one. So if you're using oats or, or barley, or in this case, triticale, you're gonna be baling more, more tons per acre. In that first year, your your alfalfa, your clovers, those are the big ones that are going to establish in year one. There's going to be some grasses that are early successional plants, like the hurry and wild rye or slender wheatgrass that will establish well in year one, and you'll still you'll see some. So by seeding that down and not doing any extra tillage, not doing any much more disturbance, what's going to happen is it's going to foster uh, more fungi development in that soil. So when you increase the fungi, that's going to increase your fun, fungal to bacteria ratio. In year two, those foragers are established, so we're not going to do any tillage on it. And you'll see very few annual weeds appearing in that stand. So we're starting to see the successional advance in our in our soil, in our plants that are, are showing up. And that would indicate, as a guess, uh, fungal to bacteria ra ratio rises to above 0.3. In year three, there is no annual weeds uh, in, in that forage. Um, forages are doing well. And you may start seeing things like sites from milk fetch and some of the native species may start showing up to the party. That's starting to show that your fungal bacteria ratio is now risen over 0.5, so it'll be in that 0.6 range. Once we have the stand in and we start seeing some woody species starting to appear, that's the signal that we have now gone over that one-to-one -one ratio of fungal to bacteria ratio. Normally what'll happen with because the bacteria, they are responsible for fast nutrient cycling. When our fungal to bacteria ratio starts rising up and we don't have a, a, a huge amount of, of fungi in the soil, but we have very relatively low levels of bacteria, our productivity starts dropping. In those situations, we need to watch those signals so that we can stimulate 
more bacteria uh, uh, population in that soil. Most productive soils are usually in that 0.6 to 0.8 fungal bacteria ratio. So that's kind of a nice spot to be to aiming for productivity wise. Because we're just talking about a ratio, it's, it's, a, it's a marker, but the productivity is going to go back to the absolute number of how much fungi and how much bacteria. So if we have a fungal to bacteria ratio of one to one, and we're only dealing with one pound of each of those per per acre that's going to be a bit of an issue if we are talking about having a hundred pounds of each that soil is going to be very productive so we can have a good fungal to bacteria ratio but we can have poor populations and this is the only way we can really tell that is getting your soils tested so whether it's the haney test whether it's sending into the chinook applied research association and oyen um, there's a uh, and l tests there's there's some companies out there that can give you a really good indication of of what what potential populations you do have active in your soil. So in that that hay field productivity is uh, in this case you know in that uh, the one to one fungal bacteria ratio, and you know the productivity is starting to drop off. So you know most people will say okay time to take it out it's tired. So they'll come in and they'll come in with a disker and they'll disk it one one or two times break it up. By doing that, every tillage you do, that's going to decrease your fungal to bacteria ratio. So in this case, a couple passes with the disc, uh, you know, it's going to be about that 0.8 in that in that fall. Then it's going to be cultivated uh, one more time in the fall, one more time in the spring, and so then your fungal to bacteria ratio is say around 0.6. In that year two, after that year of breaking. Oats are a, kind of a go-to crop to seed on hay breaking because they do very well. That year one, normally you'll see no wild oats, you won't see cleavers, you won't see some of these early successional plants. Then in the fall, we harvest that crop, we do some fall tillage. Now we're, our fungal bacteria ratio drops to about 0.5. In year three, spring tillage, seed another oat crop. Now our fungal bacteria ratio is about 0.4. Now you might start seeing some patches of wild oats in that field. We do some more fall tillage. Now your fungal to bacteria ratio is under three. In year four, when we start, once again, uh, spring tillage, seed another oat crop. Now our fungal to bacteria ratio is under 0.3. Now we're going to see lots of wild oats. Now we're going to see lots of cleavers. We're going to see a lot of those, those early successional plants growing. And this is what we need to understand how to foster this, this fungal to bacteria ratio and keeping our systems running naturally. If we support fungal populations as this bacteria population grows in our soils, we can slow down that fungal to bacteria ratio decline. And the ways we can do that are we can get into intercropping. So that's growing two cash crops together. So in this case, if we could grow some oats and we grow some peas, both are mycorrhizal, that's going to help maintain that fungal bacteria ratio. By having a green vegetative plant growing through that whole growing season, so a relay cover crop. So in that oats and peas, if we put in half a pound of Italian ryegrass, that Italian ryegrass is a biennial, which will, 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 uh, over, will not overwinter. It'll stay in that vegetative stage, and when the plant is in the vegetative stage, it will release up to 80% of the carbon it captures for photosynthesis back into the soil. When it does that, it helps to build more microbes in our soils, helps sustain that. As that root goes through the soil, it'll help support the mycorrhizae in our soil. Mycorrhizal fungi, really important thing to have. We can start using some post-harvest cover crops. So when harvest is done, turn around and put a crop in there. Once again, trying to maintain a living root in that soil for as many days as we can. We can look at livestock integration. That helps build our bacteria numbers in the soil. Um, and the biggest thing is reducing the amount of tillage. The key is reducing tillage. I know with organic, it it is under the... the uh, the, the the threat of 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 constant weeds that is one of the major tools we have 
but we need to reduce the amount of tillage. We need to keep that fungal populations up. And when we do this tillage, it kills off our fungi. It's really important to, to be able to, to get our heads around this to, to figure out a, a better way of getting it done. One of the books that I highly recommend for all producers, whether it's conventional or organic, is a book by J.L. McCammon, When Weeds Talk. Really good resource. What it does is it goes through and it describes the soil conditions that trigger specific weeds to grow, which is really important because if we understand why they grow, then we will be able to understand how to, to successfully prevent them from growing. Normally, it is uh, why these, these plants are growing is there's either a, a nutrient imbalance in that soil or there's a soil physical issue in that soil that physically is not conducive for the other species. And these weeds, early successional plants, are trying to fix that soil so that the next succession of plants can grow. When we have these weeds growing, these early successional plants, they are setting themselves up to get out of work. They want that next plant to start growing. Go through some examples now. So wild oats. Yeah, I'm sure that uh, there's wild oats on, uh, on, on most fields. And when you read the book and you look in the back uh, chart and what that uh, the book will tell you is soils will have low exchange rates of calcium and phosphate. Soils will have high exchange rates of magnesium, manganese, iron, boron, and selenium. Soils will have low porosity and will be do uh, dominated by bacteria. So in other words, wild oats are growing and they're trying to improve the soil. The way we get rid of these wild oats is increasing our fungal bacteria ratio, so building more fungi in our soil, and the wild oats magically disappear. When you build fungi in the soil, and this is basically a, a whole presentation by itself, what the fungi will do is it will be able to get into the soil, it will be able to free up a lot of phosphate in our soils, it can free up and make available the calcium. When you do a soil test, your calcium levels are absolutely through the roof. The issue our plants have is because we don't have the fungal component in our soils anymore, the plants have trouble getting that calcium into that into the plant. And that is, is one of the issues we're having in agriculture right now. So Canadian thistle, we're dealing with a different animal. What uh, when we talk book talks about is Canadian thistles. Uh, they grow in areas where they have low calcium availability, where we have dealing with hard soils, low porosity. We're dealing with low phosphate but high potassium. Dom uh, the soils are dominated by bacteria again, and we're dealing with anaerobic soil conditions, so there's not enough air in there. So instead of going in and and you know. Uh, doing lots of tillage, it can be effective if we get it early enough, but to successfully get rid of and maintain low levels of, of thistles, we need a different method of attacking these these plants. So if the they are growing in soils that anaerobic, well, let's turn this backwards and let's make these soils aerobic. And that's where, you know, if the thistles are small and you do some deep ripping, that will temporarily aerate that soil and the thistles will be in quotes controlled but bacterial soils will then collapse on themselves and that porosity then declines again and we're dealing back with anaerobic conditions. The other issue with deep ripping is when we do tillage once again that will uh, set back our fungi in our soil because it'll rip up those those hyphae roots of, of the of the fungi and then they have to regrow. So that will reduce the amount of fungi and increase the amount of bacteria. So the slaking is going to be an issue. So the slaking uh, just basically means that soil aggregates in the soil aren't going to have that integrity to, to keep that, that their, their shape. 
so they're going to fall apart on you. What we need to do for thistles is one of the most effective ways, and, and you'll see it on, on Twitter and Facebook where uh, uh, hashtag uh, roots not iron, deep rooted annual roots and or annual and biennial roots. In this case is where the radishes, we have some organic producers that we've been working with. They've been using radishes and seeding them at fairly heavy rates in these thistle patches. And within two years, they are the, the thistles are gone or basically one or two per, uh, per, per f uh, few square meters. So very manageable. And what that plant is doing, so the radishes are going to drill down and they have this, this nice big taproot. It's going to grow. It's going to then open up that soil physically because it's a, a, a taproot going down. It's going to be accumulating calcium, which when it rots is going to release to the soil, which calcium then fluffs up your soil. To have something in like chicory and sweet clover, they are biennials, so they're going to help continue on competing with those those thistle roots and give out different root exudates and what the radish will. When that radish then dies, now you have a macropore going deep into the soil. And if you don't do a lot of tillage with it, what's going to happen is it'll maintain that, that macropore, which means that soil is now going to be able to breathe. So it's a different tactic of how to aerate our soils without going in and, and doing some deep ripping. In those patches, what I recommend is going in in the spring and, and working the thistle patch, seeding down a fairly heavy rate of radish, a little bit of chicory, a little bit of sweet clover. And every time during that growing season, when you see thistle plants growing higher than the radishes, just go out with a swather or a mower and just take the tops of the thistles off. That thistle plant then has to regrow from the base. Meanwhile, if you haven't taken too much of the radish off, those radish tops are going to be able to smother the ground, still driving down the root. So with the radish, it's driven, driving its root down. The thistle is trying to get up above the canopy so it can capture sunlight to get more carbohydrate back into the root so the root can keep pushing down. So this we're going to have this, this blocker of this radish fighting them. Plus, we're going to have the chicory and the sweet clover going down, creating a big taproot. We're going to try and create as much pore space in the soil, get some earthworms going, get some fungi going, get that calcium cycle working back in that soil. So as I said, we want to have that deep taproot grow down deep into the soil. We want that root to die, leaving that root channel and allowing that air into the soil bringing up more calcium, supplying more fungi. We want to create a, a healthy system. And once again, that thistle, if left, it will actually kill itself out. It'll take a lot longer. We don't get paid well for thistles. Whereas if we can speed up this process of plant succession and soil succession, using plants that are, are going to fix that soil quicker, we're helping to fix the whole solution. Another big problem that can rise its head is stinkweed and flakeweed, so winter annuals. So they uh, germinate in the fall, they overwinter, and very early in the season they start flowering and, and can get ahead of one's crop. So those soils tend to have low calcium, very recurring theme, isn't it? And low phosphate. They have high nitrates. Those soils are bacterial dominated. What we need to do to, to fix those issues is as simple as having something green and growing in the fall. So having a fall cover crop, uh, you know, seeding some oats after harvest, uh, throwing in some radishes, that is as simple as what you need to do. Tie up that nitrate, keep a living root in the soil, and that's going to continue on building soil biology for you. And when you have soil biology, we're building organic matter, we're building soil aggregation, we're building fungi, we, we're getting a healthy system happening again. The other one, especially under these the wet years, and uh, uh, the foxtail barley has been going 
crazy in areas and in the dry areas the kochia has been a, a, a growing concern for lack of a better term so those are signs of saline saline areas so both plants are, are highly tolerant of high sodium soils high magnesium soils and but low calcium in the soil that the big difference is that high magnesium that's where you go into the the, the soil and there's no soil structure is just rock hard it's like cement especially when it dries down those areas will have high nitrates be very bacterial dominated and what you'll find in those areas is they'll you know those the, the whether it's the kosher or the foxtail they start growing early in the season they just absolutely dominate so what most people will do is go in and they'll work it once again these weeds are trying to fix the soil for you when we are dealing with those those two weeds the we need to have this integrated strategy number one we need to stop any evaporation as Jay Fear says, we have to take the, we have to stop evaporating. We need to be transpiring water. When we evaporate water, we get nothing out of it. When we, when we transpire water, that means it's gone through a plant and gone into the air. Now at least we're putting some carbon in the soil. We've we've stopped that evaporation of salts right at the surface. So having a cover crop seeded, uh, spreading some bales out there just to create some cover so we don't see the soil. That's one of the keys. The next thing we want to do is grow some deep rooted species to create internal drainage in that soil to allow that sodium to leach away. So using things like chicory, radish, sunflowers, safflower, sweet clover, sorghum sedan grass, perennial ryegrass. We want to include some tuber crops in our cover crops. Those tuber crops bring up piles of calcium. Calcium is contained in the cell walls of plants. So the more cell walls, so the more plant tissue we have, the more calcium it's bringing up. Allow that to rot, that is going to then release into the soil, knock the sodium off of the exchange sites of our soil particles, and allow that sodium to, to, to leach away through those, those tap roots, holes that we've created with the other species. The other thing about the tuber crops, they tend to be uh, yeah, a broadleaf, so they tend to scavenge and, and tie up a lot of nitrates. By doing that, that's taking nitrates away from the kochia and, and the foxtail. The foxtail and the, and, the, and the kochia have lost their ecological advantage over the rest of the crops, and they start disappearing. Once you've ID identified an area as saline, it will always be have the potential of being saline. So we always should be treating it as a saline area. The other one that I will cover is uh, the group of red root pigweed and lamb's quarters. Those are broadleaf plants, and with those, where their advantage is, is they have their their nitrate accumulators. So you have to really watch if you have uh, feed with with uh, with high pigweed and lamb's quarters, you should get it chest, uh, checked for nitrates because it'll just keep on soaking up nitrates and accumulate in the plant material so those soils tend to have low calcium low phosphate high potassium and high nitrates once again bacterial dominated soils easy easy way to get rid of it is have that green vegetative plant growing so you have in this case i put in a little bit of italian ryegrass in, underneath my crop that italian ryegrass just kept on tying up that nitrate and with my italian ryegrass my Italian ryegrass in this case, it can only take so much protein in its in its plant material. So then what it does is it releases that nitrogen that it's soaking up, so, soaked up as uh, as uh, nitrate, and then re-release it as amino acids, uh, um, ammonium back into that soil so that the weeds don't have real ac good access to it, but your cash crop does. So weeds are growing because we have managed the soil conditions to give them the ecological advantage over the plants we want to grow. We need to then, if we keep seeing a certain weed show up, we need to know why that weed is growing. 
Is it because of something we're doing or is it because of something that's in the soil that is making it grow? We also need to take a look at how we look at these weeds. Instead of calling them weeds, I've suggested that maybe we should be calling these early successional plants. Once again, terminology, but it's just to give us a, the awareness that these these plants are growing in nature because of the soil conditions, and they are looking at advancing their soil to to make it better. So we need to then change our management so that the conditions change in the soil so that those weeds don't have that advantage. Einstein came up with the, the, uh, the quote, we cannot solve the problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. And this is where we're at with our, our management because we've been fighting wild oats for, I don't know, 70, 80 years and those wild oats are smarter than us. Or are we giving them the same conditions for the last 70 years so that they can continue on growing? If we want to get rid of the, the plant, we have to change the conditions in our soils. And this is one of the things that, you know, it's a, it's a free bird, but there's uh, some, some assembly to be, to be done. This is what's happening in our soils. We have the solutions there. It's fr it, basically, it's free. The solutions are free. We don't have to go and buy a jug. We don't have to do a lot of stuff, but we have to put this together so that it actually works. And it sometimes it can be trickier than, than others. So there's my contact information. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me.